Today, we will be discussing one of the most important, famous scenes written by Bill himself and several adaptions of it. Not only will we be discussing a very famous scene from Romeo and Juliet no less, we will be presenting a brand new, never before seen film adaptation. With undiscovered actress Millie Roper playing both titular roles, Patrick Hayes create an original score as our sound designer and myself as editor, you are in for a real treat. By now, you are wondering what scene you've chosen, so I will hand this over to Millie. Thanks, Kaylin. Well, in analysing Romeo and Juliet, one particular scene often comes to mind. This is, of course, the balcony scene, or Act 2, Scene 2. As the first scene in which Romeo and Juliet truly confess their feelings for each other, the scene is hugely significant within the wider context of the play. It ultimately influences all the action to come, with the two young lovers beginning their ill-fated path together. With this in mind, we knew how important it would be to accurately portray the importance of this moment. Exactly. While the scene is of course vitally important to the events later in the play, we also chose the scene for other reasons. We found, when we were thinking about Romeo and Juliet, that there are turning points all throughout the play. In analysing the play and developing our own interpretation of the famous love story, we decided that we wanted to highlight these turning points within the text. We wanted to showcase specific moments in the play where the tone and emotion changes drastically, where characters' motivations or the way they present themselves is altered key moments where the stakes, the drama, the feel change noticeably. This is the case for Romeo and Juliet, but not for other plays where these changes tend to happen more progressively, or sometimes not at all. Exactly. You can isolate exact moments in Romeo and Juliet where critical changes happen. A key example is the death of Mercutio in Act 3, Scene 1. Many scholars, including Susan Snyder in her work Comedy into Tragedy, point to Mercutio's death as the moment where the play stops being a comedy and almost instantly becomes a tragedy. Yes, absolutely. Snyder notes in particular how Mercutio, a master of witty speech, is the symbol of the comedic genre within the play. His death marks clearly the symbolic turning point of comedy to tragedy. That one moment is a pivot point from one tonality to another. With that in mind, it is clear that turning points are crucial to the play and this scene is no exception. It is itself full of turning points in the emotion and character of the two lovers. In exploring this concept within our own interpretation, we look to other adaptations to understand how filmmakers have highlighted various turning points within the play. As one of the most famous scenes in filmic history, our take on the scene was undoubtedly influenced by these previous adaptations. Dana Perkek, in her article Sposami a Verona, argues that all perceptions of the scene have been changed immensely by adaptations and their reception in contemporary t- culture. Thus, in creating our own version of Shakespeare's so-called balcony scene, we were influenced by the unique styles of Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 version and Baz Luhrmann's 1996 take. Exactly. Zeffirelli and Lerman actually take two very different approaches to this same scene. Zeffirelli's balcony scene stays truer to Shakespeare's original setting, taking place in an old Italian castle and emphasising the youthful characteristics of Romeo and Juliet. Moreover, Zeffirelli's scene highlights the immediate and intense physical passion that Romeo and Juliet feel for each other. In contrast, Lerman takes the scene and transports it to an entirely modern context. Almost the entire scene is shot in a pool with many underwater shots. The result is a very intimate and romantic portrayal of this budding young love, showing the natural chemistry between the two actors. These versions of the scene are actually really different. Nevertheless, they both highlight the shifting tone within the text, focusing on the multiple turning points throughout the lovers' meeting. This is what we have chosen to focus on in our interpretation of the scene. We wanted to show the different shifts in motivation, emotion and drama of the scene. And in doing so, we wanted to reflect on how the play as a whole features repeated moments of shifting tensions, showing both the tragedy and comedy of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. We are very excited to present our take on the scene. We've created our own modern version of this moment, set in my backyard with Pat's stunning original music and Kaylin's masterful editing we hope you enjoy. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. (sighs) Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel. 
thought as glorious to this night being over my head as is a winged messenger of heaven. Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if that will not be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer a Capulet. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thou self, though are a Montague. What's a Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other word with smiles sweet? So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes. Without that title, Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of me, take all myself. Take thee at thy word, call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth, I never will be known as Romeo. How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? The awkward walls are high and hard to climb, and the place of death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. Love's light wings, did I perch these walls? For stony limits cannot hold love out. And what love can do, that dares love attempts. Therefore thy kingsmen are no stop for me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee. I have night's cloak to hide me from their eyes. And but thou love me, let them find me here. My life were better ended in their hate than death prorogued wanting of thy love. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on the fall. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke, but farewell compliment. Thou love me, I know thy will say I, and I will take thy word. But if thy swearest, they may provest false. They say Jove laughs on lover's perjuries. Oh gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, then prove it faithfully. Or if thou think I am too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond. I should have been more strange, I must confess. But that thou overheardest, ere I was where my true love passion. Therefore pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love which the dark night hath so discovered. Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I vow that tips with silver all these fruit tree tops. I oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes in her circled orb, unless thy love prove likewise variable. What shall I swear by? Although I joy in thee, I have no joy in this contract tonight. Good night, good night. And may sweet repose and rest come to thy as within my breast. Oh, do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine? I gave thee mine before thou didst request it, and yet I would it were to give again. Wouldst thou withdraw it? For what purpose, love? But to be frank and give it to thee again, and yet I wish but for the thing I have, 
My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. I hear some noise within. Dear love, adieu. Sweet Montague, be true. Stay but a little. I will come again. Oh, blessed, blessed night. Wow, what a truly, truly unique presentation of that scene. It's really amazing what you can do with only one actor, filmed on an iPhone, with one sound designer making an entire score, and an editor who has never edited before, during a global pandemic, and with no budget. <sighs> truly brings a tear to my eye. Mine too, Patrick. But even with these challenges, I think we're able to highlight the points in which the tone, drama, and the moods of each character shifts. The opening shots of our scenes really set up the changes to come, with close shots on Romeo and wider shots of Juliet working to establish the differences between the two characters. In differentiating the characters, we chose to work from the costume colour palette set out in Zeffirelli's adaptation, using a blue t-shirt for Romeo and an orange jumper and yellow earrings for Juliet. For practicality, we also use point of view shots here to establish the locations of the two characters, something which is really important when you only have one actor. We drew the inspiration for these shots from Zeffirelli's adaptation, which features similar establishing shots. As the actors are far apart on his large set, these close-ups make the geography of the scene clear to the viewer. Exactly. And as Kaylin said, it's in this opening that we establish the turning points to come within the scene. This can be seen clearly in Juliet's opening monologue, which is later contrasted by a dramatic shift in mood for the character. Before Romeo reveals himself to Juliet, she is a little more fanciful when talking about Romeo, when she thinks she is in private. I'll no longer be a Capulet, she says, making the implication that she will deny her own heritage to be with the charming young man. She ends, before she is interrupted, by saying, take all myself. We tried to convey this sense of romanticism and the intimacy of Juliet's thoughts in a number of ways. Firstly, in the use of a balcony-type setting, which in our case was actually just a hole in my garden shed. So by placing Juliet here, we were able to connect with the romantic connotation of the balcony, which has been expressed in both Zeffirelli and Lerman's adaptations of the scene. Valentine Morassan, in her article Sweeping Her Off Her Feet, Courting Moves and Language, suggests that a mere shot of an architectural element similar to a balcony activates the connotational meaning of the balcony as a sign of love, setting expectations for the viewers towards romance and a tragic love story. We also tried to create this romantic and angelic-like portrait of Juliet through the use of a religious motif. This decision was influenced by Lurman's extensive use of religious imagery throughout his film adaptation. In his version, Juliet's room contains scores of angels and a shrine to the Virgin Mary. And in reference to this, we chose to include a portrait of Jesus, which featured during her monologue. The manner in which Juliet leads on the portrait as she ponders the pointlessness of a name shows the connection to this religious motif. Um, but it also connects to Lumen's choice to highlight their relationship as more spiritual and less lustful and physical as in Zeffirelli's adaptation. The religious motif comes from Shakespeare's script, which features numerous references to religion. Juliet is described as a winged messenger of heaven, an angel, and Romeo also calls Juliet dear saint. Of particular importance is when Romeo reveals himself, saying that he will be new baptised. Here, he is talking partly about revoking his name of Montague, but also of being reborn and re-enlightened through his dedication to Juliet. We found this religious motif important in the scene, so at Romeo's reveal, with the new baptised line, I included a reference to the Hallelujah Chorus in the musical score, a well-known religious musical leitmotif. Another nod to Lerman's adaptation can be seen at the end of the monologue as Juliet asks Romeo to take all myself. I included a shot of Juliet looking into a small pond at this moment, creating the sense of reflection that is evident throughout the monologue. This mirrors Lerman's use of water in the scene as a whole. Just as our Juliet looks into the pond, so does Lerman's Juliet lean over the swimming pool. In doing so, we were able to draw in Lerman's use of water as a force to make the moment feel more sensual and intimate? But while Juliet is prepared to give herself to Romeo here, once he makes his presence known, she completely changes, marking the first major turning point of the scene. As Romeo reveals himself to her, she becomes much more questioning of him. Juliet asks, Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? But this is not a mere question of identity, as it seems on the surface. She proves she knows Romeo's identity in the line before. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, yet I know the sound. 
Instead, this question, art thou not Romeo and a Montague, is one of motivation. Yes, here Juliet is questioning Romeo's motivations and how true he is in claiming to love her. She has already said that she is committed to him and what she thought was her privacy, but once she is revealed, her tone changes. She wants to know that he is prepared to make an honest commitment, one that overrules his being as Montague. At Romeo's reveal, the turning point takes place and Juliet's character changes. This scene sees a lot of shifts for Juliet, and I think this came across clearly in our interpretation. I tried to provide a clear path of transition for Juliet in this moment, showing that she moves from a gentle imaginative girl in her opening monologue to becoming a more stern and grounded point of reference to Romeo's fanciful characterization. This was relatively easy to convey as the text alludes to it, the lyrical language of Juliet's opening monologue with little punctuation to divide her free-flowing thoughts is clearly contrasted by her intense questioning of Romeo when she first sees him. Jill Levinson in Shakespearean performance highlights this, suggesting that the variation in Shakespeare's verse reveals the variations in the protagonist, their changing moods, perception and intensities shifting the contours of the personality. In further conveying this as a point of transition, I changed the music here to reflect Juliet's questioning tone. I composed a theme for Romeo and Juliet, which plays throughout the scene, but I made sure in this moment to adjust the harmony underneath the melody to reflect Juliet's tonality. This is a powerful tool in the composer's toolbox. In particular, I scored the line, they say Jove laughs at lover's perjuries, with a dissonant polychord. Having Romeo lie to her in love is the main thing Juliet fears in this moment, so I felt it was crucial to make the sickly nature of this concept felt, before resolving at the more affectionate and pleading, O gentle Romeo. Here, Juliet is speaking affectionately by calling him gentle and requesting that he pronounce his love faithfully, no longer questioning him as intently. So here the music returns to its more calm harmonies. Another really important turning point in the scene is Romeo's line, Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? Before this point, Juliet is much more reserved with her feelings and is inquisitive of Romeo's motivation. This can be seen in the use of more measured movements and more quiet vocalisations. But as Romeo asks her this question, it is clear that something has changed for her. She asks, what satisfaction canst thou have tonight? She still isn't totally on board with this lover boy Romeo, but when he offers the exchange of love's faithful vow for mine, she openly accepts him. I gave thee mine, and yet I would it were to give again. In both Lumerans and Zeffirelli's adaptations, this turning point in the script is given a dramatic turnaround. In Zeffirelli's version, Juliet embraces Romeo and gives her delivery of lines 138 to 142, with Romeo excitedly kissing her neck, her own delivery now far more impassioned. Lumeran, however, takes a similar approach, having the couple fall back into the swimming pool in an embrace. Here, Lumeran chose to remove Juliet's speech and present just the visual of the two embracing underwater with music to accompany. Yes, and I was particularly proud of the music we used in our own production at this moment. As we've discussed, this scene in the play is full of distinctive turning points, and I really wanted to make sure those turning points were highlighted in the scoring. The music in both Lerman's and Zeffirelli's films highlights this wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied moment. Zeffirelli's in particular brings in a first light plucked string reiteration of the movie's key leitmotif for the couple. Then a violin echoes the melody. And then at the climax of this turning point, as Juliet says, to be frank and give it thee again, the ensemble soars higher over her impassioned speech. This choice really shows the importance of this moment as Zeffirelli chose to present the scene mostly absent of music, but its use here at this key moment highlights this turning point's importance to the scene. Lerman's is similar. Most of the scene is not scored with prominent music, but a thick string ensemble plays after the two lovers fall back into the pool again. Yes. And without any dialogue at that moment, the music in Lerman's version of the scene is very important. Exactly. At that point, the couple are shown holding each other underwater, with the music carrying the movie's sound profile and scoring the emotion in that moment. I think we achieved a better balance, though, with the score rising up, but underneath Juliet's lines, which I think are crucial here. I agree. This is another turning point for Juliet. While she has been reigning in her emotions and reasoning with her feelings since Romeo's appearance, that outburst from Romeo helps her to realise this intensity of her feelings for him. She gives into his fantastical language, adopting that lyrical language of her own. 
My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. And while Lerman used the intimate setting of the pool to convey this moment, and Zeffirelli used intense physical contact, we chose to use a number of close-up shots on Juliet. This provided a clear point of contrast to the wide and mid shots used earlier. The intense focus on my face and eyes here provided that intimacy and the level of connection between the two characters. Exactly, and by using these close-up shots we were able to portray the intimacy of the moment without having our Romeo and Juliet actually physically touch. This also provided a nice ending for our scene overall, hopefully leaving viewers with a sense of deep emotional connection between the two characters and showcasing how they have evolved over the course of the scene. While our adaptation might not have had the same scope, budget or resources of Zeffirelli or Lerman's takes, I think we still managed to highlight the important aspects of the scene, guided by Shakespeare's script. We hope you've been able to see how turning points function within the scene and how important they are to the play as a whole.